Hi, I'm Morten Sovic, Vice President of Mala Foundation and host and producer of the Mala Hour, where we bring you the personalities, places, and projects happening right now in the Mala community around the world. Welcome, and welcome to YouTube Live. Last month, we brought you a special look at the priceless Mala Rosé collection at the University of Western Ontario. Brian McMillan described where these manuscripts and family documents came from. Stephen McClatchley walked us through a poignant set of letters from early in the courtship of Gustav and Alma, including the Mahler's correspondence with his sister, Justina, about his bride-to-be. And Francisco Brizio described how Mahler Foundation is helping in the massive effort to digitalize these materials and bring them online. We concluded the show with the marriage certificate of Gustav and Alma from Marina Mahler's personal collection a document that raised as many questions as it answered. We plan to return to the mysterious date on the certificate in a later show as we unravel the historical and documentary evidence behind it. Remember, you can see this show and all past Malo Hours on our website. This installment of the Malo Hour will take a look at four very different approaches to Mahler's Second Symphony, a podcast, a piano transcription, and a listening guide, all of them recent releases, plus a filmic interpretation of the work. We are going to take a closer look at these inherently different forms of expression, learn what makes it, goes into making them, and ask what these intense examinations of Mahler's composition might have in common. Before we begin, let me remind everyone attending live to post any questions you might have for our guests to the comments section. We will get to these at the end of our show. Don't forget to include your name or at least the city and country you are writing from. Also, the Mahler Hour is brought to you by Mahler Foundation. So if you want to support our activities, please become a member. Just go to our website at mahlerfoundation.org for all of the details. Turning to our topic, since its earliest performances, Mahler's Second Symphony has fascinated audiences and performers alike for its towering breadth and search for a vision of the meaning of life and death. As Mahler himself wrote about the work, here too, the greatest question is asked, what did you live for? Why did you suffer? Is it all only a vast and terrifying joke? We have to answer these questions somehow if we are to go on living. Indeed, even if we are only to go on dying. The person whom, whose life this call has resounded, even if it was only once, must give an answer. And I give this answer in the last movement, he writes. The manuscript to which you see here, with the words, Auferstehen. Mahler's answer, as I said, is the second symphony, and it is that compelling mission that may well be what still captivates us and inspires such bountiful commentary ever since its premiere in 1895. A very recent example of this type of creative response is the podcast series, Embracing Everything, The World of Gustav Mahler, produced and directed by Aaron Cohen, now in its second season, the podcast tackles the second symphony. My first guest today is the musical and historical advisor for this production, musicologist Marilyn McCoy, who teaches at Columbia University and Barnard College. Welcome, Marilyn. Thank you, Martin. You have been involved in many things Malarian over the years, most prominently perhaps your 15 years as annual pre-concert and symposium lecturer at the Mahler Fest in Boulder, Colorado, That's where right. some of your audiences may know you from there. How did you come to this role in the podcast? Well, it turns out that this was a longtime passion project for Aaron Cohen. Um, he's the uh, program director at WQXR, WNYC, the public radio and classic radio station in New York. And he'd done some features on Strauss, and he himself is an oboe player, but he loved Mahler and really wanted to make a long podcast uh, where he could address every symphony and do it in some kind of detail, deep detail. And so he was looking for a musicologist. And what happened was I was giving a talk at the Gustav Mahler Society of New York about the sketches for Um Mitternacht, the fourth movement of the third symphony. And he saw me and he said, yes, this is the kind of person I want to work with. And I think what he liked about me was that um, I was kind of informal and kind of relaxed and had a sense of humor, but also knew a lot. <laughs> and so all of these things uh, kind of led us to into this endeavor, which is really fun, but also, you know, involves a lot of research and listening and uh, reaching out to other people that have different roles in bringing these symphonies to life. So what's the overall goal, goal of the series? 
Well, the overall goal is to make people, invite people to fall in love with the, Gust life, with the life and especially the music of Gustav Mahler. And so we approach this from several fronts. Uh, actually, usually where it begins is Aaron interviews me for, well, he sends me questions and I try to answer them. And since he reads English and I read German, uh, we're kind of researching from two ends. Uh, he interviews scholars of literature, poetry. He also, in his position, is able to interview conductors, to interview orchestral musicians. And so uh, all around, he just tries to talk to as many people as he can. And then we talk about the piece for hours and hours. And, and I know these works well, and he knows them as a player. And, and usually we come to all kinds of new thoughts together. There's a really nice organic, sort of organic chemistry between us. And so we both realize things that we hadn't figured out before. And so we decided first off to do the first four symphonies as much as we could. And so that, just doing that prep took a while. And then Aaron is the, one, is the producer. He's the one who cuts and pastes and scripts all of this. But then I'm the one who speaks German, and so I'm always helping with German pronunciation. Also, a lot of the musical analysis is my approach to a particular work. And so I have to say, no, no, you can't have that piece of text before we hear this chord, uh, that kind of thing. So um, it, it's really, really fun. But it's a lot of work as well. So it's a wonderful creative uh, effort. And, and as you were saying, the approachability of, of your style, of course, is, is vital to an audience that uh, aren't, you know, is not full of musicologists. And one would think, you know, your approach has, is to say, okay, we're going to take this piece of music and we're going to go through a listening medium to present it. So it's an auditory approach to work of music. And of course, that's very fitting. It makes a lot of sense. Yet, ironically, it has some problems. Most notably, I would think, to find words that actually describe what the music does. That's true, but I, I think all of us that teach music and all of us that give pre-concert lectures, uh, actually, I sort of feel like this is sort of one of my missions in life. And the way that I say it is, I want to talk about classical music, which is music I feel passionate about, to quote, normal people. People <laughs> that don't know anything about classical music, and especially Mahler, where you have to have patience and these pieces last a long time. And so I try really hard not to use jargon. I try really hard to uh, think of ways that they can come into the music and come into Mahler's creative thought in a way that's approachable. And one nice thing about the podcast kind of uh, way of presentation is that people listen to podcasts all the time now. It is the thing that people do when they're driving, when they're studying, when they hard to be doing both things at once, but they do. Um, and so it's it's out there and it's a, a, a surprisingly accessible to a lot of people. And so that also appealed to us. And of course, Mahler in some places does make it a little bit easier to get into the piece, right? There are with the presence of text in Mahler's compositions that will help frame the discussion, right? Well, so, sometimes yes, but some of these texts, for example, the text of the Wunderhorn songs, the, the youth magic horn, these folk texts, texts, some of them are kind of bizarre and um, or strange because they're very particular to German and Austrian culture. Um, and so that's why Aaron has interviewed a, a number of literary scholars, you know, to help. But then also to, for example, um, Urlicht, which is a song uh, from the Second Symphony for soloist. Um, the, po the poem is only 10 lines long, but the way that Mahler sort of um, interweaves the text and its meaning with the musical presentation is incredible. It, it's a, a jewel in a very small space. And I want to bring that out. I am a singer and I want to bring that out and I'm a musician. And so that's what I, I wouldn't say that we fought about it. But when we decided to have someone read the translation over the German translation, like I had to say, no, 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 you know, he can't talk here or he's going to have to talk faster because well, this musical moment, et cetera. Well, let's, I, I don't want to interrupt, but let's just listen to this. The opening yeah. segment covering Urlicht, uh, the fourth movement of the second symphony, uh, and keep some of this in mind. Yeah. I think we're supposed to get audio here. Everything about this 
song. This movement is special and unique. Music professor Marilyn McCoy of Columbia University. Every note counts. Every rhythmic value counts. Every rest, every pause, every word. The song is called Primeval Light. In German, it's Urlicht. Ur means the most ancient, the source of all light. When God says, let there be light, the oldest original light of creation. Carter Bray, principal cello of the New York Philharmonic. This seems to be the place, despite the fact that there's another movement to go, it strikes me as the spiritual heart of the symphony. The text again comes from Des Knaben Wunderhorn, the Boys' Magic Horn Collection by Brentano and Arnhem. It comes from early on in Volume 2, published in 1808. Unlike St. Anthony's Sermon to the Fish, which had a literary source, Brentano and Arnhem heard this one out in the world, transcribed it, and added it to their collection. We don't know how much editing they did. It's only 10 lines. Joanna Neely, a professor of German at Oxford University. I think you can almost even hear the meaning of this song in Mahler's setting because the music tells us it's really a poem of two parts, despite the fact that actually the original format is one ten-line stanza. Here's the first part of the poem, the opening four lines, in translation. Oh, little red rose, humanity lies in greatest need. Humanity lies in greatest pain. How I would rather be in heaven. According to Mahler, the lyrics are the voice of naive faith, an unquestioning faith, the faith of a child who doesn't need to be convinced that God and heaven exist, but simply believes they exist and is ready to go to heaven right now. Marilyn McCoy. There's basically a sort of a different orchestral sound world for each line or for each kind of concept in the text. Mahler will underline the meaning of each phrase the mezzo-soprano sings by painting a musical portrait using different instruments each time. But the orchestra does more than accompany the vocalist in this song. It's also a dialogue between singer and orchestra, a musical discussion. So here you're setting up, the, explaining the title, uh, putting it in the context of the movement and the piece, giving a preview of its standing in the work as a whole introducing the text. Uh, it's a wonderful sort of, oh, I can't wait to hear the poem, right? Uh, <laughs> so what's next? Well, what's next is the presentation of the song played, um, actually a wonderful recording with Sarah, Dame Sarah Connolly singing. And our actor, uh, James Lurie, who re is Mahler's voice, he reads the poem again. And then there's Aaron's commentary, which is sort of based on my commentary, and then there's the singing. And right. so those things are interwoven in a way to bring out all of these things that are going on at the same time. Right. So let's listen to the, how this choreography is played out. Let's have the next uh, audio. Oh, little red rose. The Brass Chorale is our first musical portrait. Michael Sachs, principal trumpet of the Cleveland Orchestra. You want something that's very, very docile, very clean sounding, you know, very warm and very, very rounded, almost like a men's choir. The choir of heaven calling to humanity. Humanity lies in greatest need. Humanity lies 
in greatest pain. How I would rather be in heaven. Mahler repeats this line because it's the key to this song. I would rather be in heaven. Solo oboe takes over from the singer, presenting a musical portrait of longing and loneliness. Captivating and beautifully done. It's letting the sung words provide it, their own commentary to the music. Correct. And you know, one of the advantages in bringing it in this format, of course, is that, um, and this may sound strange, people understand the words. Many, many, an English speaker, of course, is falls in love with this music and would fall in love with it even more if they knew the words. And so this is a tremendous, tremendous service in bringing that forth. Now, it's really, really important. And I think, I mean, I'm a, I'm a singer myself, but I underestimate, I always try to provide a translation for the students. And even then, like you almost need to have it running under because then people can actually keep up with each word, which is more important than we realize, I think, a lot of times. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about another challenge because uh, there's a lot more here than, than the text. What about the purely instrumental music without text? Well, that is definitely the most uh, challenging part. Although, again, I've, I've spent a lot of years of my life concentrating on figuring out on exactly about how to do this. And so one of the advantages uh, we have with Mahler's music, but especially with the second, is that this is dramatic, emotion-filled music. And so there are things, for example, in the first movement where there's kind of this anger versus heaven and peace. And then there's also the bass is kind of sneaking in, you know, between those two things. And so um, there's also bigger uh, sort of formal habits that Mahler has, building up to big climaxes, uh, etc. And so um, I can kind of map my way through the piece by showing these kind of larger structures that add up to the entire structure. And so that's that's kind of how I approach it. And again, I think that's how all of us do, because although all of us who teach music have to find a way to do this, um, you know, most people just can't. I guess even we as listeners, knowing getting to know Mahler ourselves, had to work through it and figure out, gain our own understanding before we could really communicate it to others. So that's that's what we do. That's what I do. And then sometimes Aaron rephrases it in a way that he finds that's really wonderful. So. Of course, I also have to add, sometimes we have the extremely good fortune of having numerous texts by Mahler himself that reveals his own thinking about the work. And that is something that this podcast, of course, makes very, very good use of. Let's listen to one such passage from uh, the first moment that you were just referring to. No, oh, that's great. Mahler said this. The first movement depicts the titanic struggles of a mighty being still caught in the toils of this world, grappling with life and with the fate to which he must succumb, his death. We've met this mighty being before. It may interest you to know that it's the hero of my D major symphony, my first symphony, who's being born to his grave. 
his life being reflected as in a clear mirror from a point of vantage. Much of the first movement of the Second Symphony is a giant funeral march. Music professor Marilyn McCoy of Columbia University. This funeral march is furious. It's in a rage. It is angry. And it's hard to think of many funeral marches that have that anger. Someone shaking their fist at death. Uh, we could go on with many more examples of how this podcast turns Mahler's symphony into a wonderfully pleasant journey for the mind. Um, but I want to I want to leave with a question about how this in, has impacted you personally. What 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 does Mahler's second symphony mean to you, Marilyn? And and what does this project maybe help bring out in that in that relationship you have with this music? Well, Mahler's second definitely has sort of a special place in my heart and my experience. I, I think I've lectured and talked about it more than any other symphony except maybe the ninth. And there's just so much in it and so much to carry a listener along. And there's so much drama and the ending is so transcendent and just blows everyone out of the water. And I think there's, in, in our trailer, I sort of say, people don't believe that music can do this kind of thing to you. And Mahler definitely can. And then for me personally, this is the most fulfilling and fun thing that I've ever done. <laughs> I feel like it really plays to my strengths um, as a teacher and as a speaker and as a musician. And Eric, Aaron is like the, the perfect, uh, yeah, person and partner to work with. And it's just so much fun. And I've learned so much more about music I thought I already knew really well. So, and also just having the conductors talk and having the, the performers talk and the literary scholars um, and the voices and the actors. I mean, the whole thing has become just so, so much fun. And we, all of us are having fun. So, um, you know, that's, it's always nice when one is able to enjoy <laughs> one's primary activity. Well, um, we uh, posted the, uh, the URL uh, with those audio examples. We'll also be posting it on our website. Everyone, don't forget to have a listen to this wonderful podcast. And uh, thank you, Marilyn, very much for being our guest today. Just one last plug. Season three, Mahler's third, is coming up in November. So be ready. <laughs> very thank good. You. Thanks, Martin. <laughs> thank you, Marilyn. Just a reminder, if you are with us live, feel free to send us questions through the chat. We'll be happy to answer these at the end of the hour. We turn now to another medium for exploring Mahler's symphonies, film. My next guest is widely known as the preeminent documentary filmmaker on Mahler and a previous guest on our show, Jason Starr. Welcome back, Jason. Uh, good to be with you. Um... Uh, am I on? I'm wondering if you could see me because I just see a full screen. You um, are going to be on screen very soon. Oh, okay. Just a little confusing there. But uh, <laughs> great to be with you. So I'm going to jump right into it. If, if talking about music is difficult, is it any easier to make a film about it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, easier. Um, uh, like what Marilyn uh, and Aaron would say is that it's a heck of a lot of fun. And uh, probably not unlike their experience, it's a, a tremendous learning experience. Uh, in effect, you're in the role of a teacher but, uh, or an educator, but in fact, you are learning as you go because it is just so bottomless. Uh, these masterpieces, each one of these symphonies and song uh, cycles and groups are um, absolutely bottomless in terms of what they offer. So um, it's uh, a great, it's a really joyful experience to be working with this material more than anything else I could imagine. Let's watch the trailer for your film entitled Of Love, Death and Beyond, Exploring Mahler's Resurrection Symphony to get an idea of how you have approached this musical work. Thank you. 
imagine. You are a composer in your 20s and a thinker as well. The mysteries of life stimulate sounds and ideas. The greatest mystery of all, death, seizes you. Raising questions so powerful, so far beyond language, that only through music could you answer them. What is this life and this death? Is there for us a continuation? Is all this only an empty dream? Or does this life and this death have a meaning? The Resurrection Symphony was important for me because it forces me to deal with the fact that I will die and what happens to me after I die. Why are we here? What's so fascinating about Mahler is that he's capable of turning these philosophical queries into musical events. The piece begins with this outburst of anger. Why must it be like this? Why do all our strivings have to simply lead to an end? And what's the role of love in making sense of all this struggle? Love's the first experience in most of our lives that shows us that we're part of something larger than ourselves. There's an element of the infinite in love in that way. <laughs> Of course, we'll be also on our website telling you how you can acquire this film if you already haven't already seen it. Uh, and Jason, so many huge questions, uh, so many places to go with these uh, with these topics. Uh, what what did you want to achieve with this film? What was the sort of the? This seems to be such a huge picture of of life and death and even beyond. Where do you? Um, where do you go from that starting point? Yeah, it's uh, it's tough to answer because there are, are so many starting points in essence, but at the center of all of my Mahler documentary films is an exploration of how Mahler created a musical language capable of communicating meaning. That is philosophical, spiritual ideas, but the world of ideas that Mahler injects into his symphonies are intentionally not easy to understand, let alone explain. <laughs> uh, he is very careful to keep possibilities open and above all to encourage his listeners to make what they can out of his music. Um, I think he wanted to have it both ways, actually. He didn't want overthinking to obscure the power of the emotional content, but he also wanted his audience to keep certain ideas in mind, sort of as a frame or filter. So he gives hints, sometimes with titles, uh, sometimes with sung texts, uh, sometimes with words scribbled into the score, and sometimes within the music itself. And of course, there's a large body of letters and accounts of conversations people had with him about the meaning of his music. 
So my job as a documentary filmmaker is to sort through it all and present an exploration of the meanings expressed in a particular work in hopefully a coherent way, yet without shutting down other avenues of interpretation. Now, in terms of the second symphony, there is an elephant in the room, that being the name people have given it, Resurrection, a title he didn't use. Yet the text he chose for the finale, most of which he authored himself, is about resurrection. So uh, to get to your question, uh, what resurrection may have meant for Mahler would be a really good starting point because it's certainly not what most people would have expected. So explicating that was one of uh, the main goals of the film. So you begin with the last movement and perhaps work your way back through it. I mean, is so, or does this somehow emerge over the months as you're working on this? Uh, something about the creative process here would be interesting to know how that all works itself out in, in your mind because you, you have to have a framework at some point. Yes. Well, Morton, you, uh, having been a participant in the filmmaking, uh, not only as a on-camera scholar, but um, as an advisor uh, to me, uh, you may recall we have uh, many hours of conversations thinking this through. Um, I also have the great benefit of, of talking to other music historians and thinkers uh, to help me formulate an outline that once I get into production, I continually modify. In this case, there were a few key elements that I knew would be central from the beginning. One was the influence on Mahler by his close friend, Siegfried Lippner, who was a philosopher and poet and whose translation of a Polish epic poem was just at that time published in German as Totenfeier. Another key element for me was a book written by the philosopher Martha Nussbaum called Upheavals of Thought, where she presents really novel and very important insights into the symphony. And then there's Mahler's love for Marianne von Weber, slightly older woman who with a husband and children was an impossibility for Mahler, but for a time they were seriously in love. That period overlapped the composition of the first movement and there's evidence he thought about her for years after that, despite it all having been broken off. As I began work on the film, many other elements were added to it. One, of course, being a basic analysis of the music in terms of symbols and citations. The most obvious being his use of the DS array in the first and last movements. Morten, you asked if the message emerges as I work on the film. And yes, it does. There are so many interesting ideas conveyed by the music and the texts that Mahler uses. So it's often all too easy to get lost following up on some of them and then perhaps losing sight of something even more important. Uh, what became most crucial for me as I got deeper into making the film was Mahler's view of an all encompassing love. A love that was not only agape, a generous transcendent love, but also passionate, even erotic. So often these are thought of as mutually exclusive, but not for Mahler. That line from his poem in the last movement, in the hot striving of love, that addresses desire as much as it does compassion and generosity. It gives us a physical stake in the process of becoming more authentic and loving, which I think is the kind of rebirth he had in mind. So uh, Mahler's spirituality, which is conveyed musically and poetically, uh, opens up rather than closes down. It, there's so much to talk about here. I mean, as so you as you get this trajectory, of course, you have to you have to bring so many elements together: the music, the texts, the commentary, the visuals. How how do you <laughs> orchestrate this? To borrow a term from the music you're looking at, put it all together. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, it's hard to say in a nutshell. I mean, once a comprehensive approach 
for the symphony is conceived, there's a the challenge naturally of piecing together the ideas expressed in the numerous interviews. Uh, the selection of interview subjects is crucial, uh, but for Of Love, Death and Beyond, uh, I also wanted a narrator. And Thomas Hampson, who is uh, at the time already agreed to sing St. Anthony's Sermon to the Fish, was enormously generous in agreeing to narrate as well. And uh, that's really helpful because the narration uh, uh, facilitates transitions uh, going from one idea to another smoothly. But um, in addition to the many great Mahler scholars such as yourself and Stephen Heffling and Peter Franklin, Henri-Louis de Lagrange, Donald Mitchell and Constantin Floros um, who all participate, I invited the philosopher Martha Nussbaum and theologians Catherine Keller and Neil Gilman. So we had a pretty knowledgeable and enthusiastic group. Um, then comes the lengthy process of editing it all together. So it hopefully becomes an exciting and reasonably easy to follow film. And uh, integrating musical examples, creating visualizations. You know, these are each considerable processes that um, I doubt we have time to get into now. Although I'm dying to tell the story, Morton, of um, uh, when we were going to film that burial scene because you were there in Steinbach. Uh, uh, so I'll do it really quickly. Um, uh, we're having breakfast. The first thing we're going to shoot is uh, something that you saw in the um, uh, trailer of um, uh, uh, mourners uh, burying um, uh, an individual. And we hired a backhoe to dig the grave on property that we were allowed to do this on by the town. And we get an emergency phone call from the director of photography. You gotta come here immediately. We hop in the car, we drive up there. There was a geyser of water. I mean, at least a hundred feet going up into the air. They hit a main water valve. Um, a pipe and everybody in the entire area, it turns out, was now without water. And so I was walking around, you know, imagining lawsuits <laughs> and uh, who knows what else would follow. And the mayor of the town walked up to us and said, oh, don't worry, we have the engineer coming. I have another place that would be even better for you to film this scene. So he took us to a children's park and so the irony of shooting a burial scene with children off camera on swings, uh, enjoying themselves was just the epitome of Malarian irony. Um, it's, it's something I'll never forget. Yeah, life, life has incredible things in store. And I, yes, the Malarian irony, of course, and the good people of Steinbach who were so generous. And of course, are all the extras in that burial scene there that you talked about where they're walking right. up towards the church. Uh, they were very generous with their time and did everything they could to, to make this film as beautiful as possible. And it's, it, was quite, it was quite an experience, if, absolutely. So I, I wanna conclude, you, you have produced five Mahler films to date in order of production. They were on the third, the second, Das Lied von der Erde, the first, and Lieder eines Vater und Gesellen, the Songs of a Wayfarer. Were there any particular challenges associated with the Second Symphony? You've done a lot of them now. Was there anything special about this particular film? Well, the second, there's, there was a lot that was particular. The Second Symphony provided an extra challenge because there are no movement titles, unlike the Third Symphony, which as you just mentioned, I began with, that, uh, that clearly convey a comprehensive scheme. Um, but, you kind of can intuit that there is one. Just hearing that seemingly unprovoked eruption in the third movement, what Mahler called the cry of despair, kind of alerts you to the fact that something more than beautiful music is going on here. So I wanted to see what ties all the movements together into a kind of narrative, if in fact there is one. And I wanted to show the film's audience the enormous scope and depth of Mahler's thinking. Uh, you know, we think of uh, Kant writing these 
single sentences that go on for pages. Uh, Mahler is without words, just with notes on a page, so articulate and um, insightful and revealing of some of the most important aspects of what it is to be alive. Um, that was important to convey in the film. What, uh, what does the second symphony mean to you personally? Uh, well, it asks us, um, as Marilyn just referenced, um, to consider the issues we all should face if we are to be thoughtful and honest with ourselves. Uh, what is the value of what we do, of our striving, our work, of our suffering, um, our loving? So the first movement questions the efforts of an individual, which we can all identify with. We don't have to be the hero of the first symphony, although that's a particularly interesting uh, uh, track to, uh, to think of this on. But the, the second and third movements present us with a more down to earth answer. In effect, um, enjoy ourselves in society, uh, be it part of um, a, a social uh, world or a religious community. Um, that's where most people exist. Um, we live to be with our friends, to enjoy experiences with them. But Mahler, with his wit and sarcasm, exposes the limitations of this thinking with that musical cry of despair and brings us to a very vulnerable, lonely place where the fourth movement begins. Um, it's a child's voice crying out, really for relief from the suffering of the world. And, and I think this gets to the heart of the symphony because the relief comes from faith, but is it uh, faith in God or in oneself? And if it is God, what is this deity? Does it reward virtue and obedience or does it nurture and encourage our own striving, uh, finding our own creative paths? Uh, Morton, to hear music that magically lures us to pay attention to life and encourages a process of self-examination and does that with you know, the emotional intelligence and eloquence and humanity and love that only a rare genius can offer, this is one of the most meaningful experiences one can have. Um, how many of us are not a bit shaken at the end of a Mahler symphony and particularly this one. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you for your thoughts, Jason, and thank you for talking with us today. A pleasure. Of course, there are many ways of experiencing the second symphony. Most of us today might attend a live concert or listen to a recording, watch a film or hear a podcast. But there is another way, one that used to be almost the only way to experience Mahler's second symphony playing it on the piano. In the days before recordings and during the many years when performances of the work were almost non-existent, this symphony, like an enormous number of classical works, would be played at home. Piano arrangements of symphonies, concertos, and chamber works were produced since the early 19th century for a huge market of often very talented amateurs who had no other access to these masterpieces. Believe it or not, and you can see it here in the photo, Mahler's symphonies were no exception. Just months after its world premiere, Hermann Bain, the composer's friend and benefactor in Hamburg, produced a version of the Second Symphony for two pianos. I think you can see his name. Yeah, there you go. You can see it more closely there. This was the first one produced, and it was this arrangement, in fact, that Mahler played just months later uh, at Atazé in 1896, uh, very, very likely in the presence of um, Johannes Brahms at a uh, soiree uh, not far from Steinbach. There was another arrangement, a forehand arrangement uh, by Mahler's uh, former assistant Bruno Walter as well. I think we have, a, have one, uh, you can see the frontispiece for that. Yeah, here's the, uh, the Universal Edition publication of the Bruno Walter forehand arrangement. The Hermann Bain was four hands, but it was two pianos. Just how many arrangers have tried to, their hand at a version for solo piano, I don't know. But today I have the good fortune of introducing one that will be available exclusively on the Mahler Foundation website. 
For this, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the young Alexander Viviero. Welcome, Alexander. Good morning, Dr. Solvik. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor. So tell us first a little bit about yourself. Yes, of course. So I am Alexander Rivero. I'm from Guadalajara, Mexico. And I am a pianist. I am a composer currently studying orchestral conduction as well. And so I decided to do this solo piano transcription from this masterpiece from Mahler, no, the second symphony. And this is one of my most recent works. And I think it has been a really interesting experience that has taught me a lot and has helped me to see music in a different way. So um, when did you discover Mahler? This, is, this can't be just happenstance. You must have had some experience with him before throwing yourself into this project. Yes, so I actually discovered Mahler through his second symphony. That's what motivated me and that's what made me do it about this symphony, the transcription. It all started when a couple of years ago, my parents uh, gifted me on Christmas a uh, CD with Mahler's second symphony. In this moment, I may have only heard Mahler maybe once or twice listed as a great composer, but haven't really heard anything about him, haven't really investigated or listened to any of his pieces so coming back home I put on the CD and it's just mind-blowing <laughs> I remember listening to the first movement trying to understand what's happening because it's a very complicated piece a huge orchestration but getting to the last movement I remember getting goosebumps for the final couple of bars because it's it's amazing and it took my breath away so that's what motivated me to do the piano solo transcription of the symphony because I think it's very important for people not only playing in orchestra, but for us, for example, pianists, to be able to not only listen to this masterpiece, to be able to play it, experience it. And with this piano transcription, what I try to do is uh, not only to have the notes, but to have the emotion, to convey the emotion to the pianist that's playing it, that mother wanted to to portray in his work because then he adds voices in the final four and fifth movements, uh, he adds a chorus. And I think that will be one of the most challenging things because here I only have two hands. And to begin with, well, <laughs> Mahler has a huge orchestration. He has about, about many horns, he has many percussion. And to be able to portray that, but not only that, but like the lyrics, the emotion without having someone singing it, I think it will be a great challenge, but it has been a blast of an experience. It has been incredible for me. And I think it's one of the projects that I have enjoyed the most doing. And not only writing down the actual transcription, but getting to know about the piece, uh, doing my research about Mahler, about the movements. I think that has helped me a lot and has been very interesting for me. So most 11 or 12 year olds who get a recording of a piece are happy to listen to it and be inspired by it. Uh, there was something more to your interest in this and that was in a sense to get inside of it. Uh, I mean, to, you know, to experience a work, you know, to find a perspective on a piece of music beyond listening and actually playing it as a pianist is quite remarkable. How did you go about reducing this massive orchestra to, to two hands? So first thing I did was to spend probably about five or six months analyzing the first movement, uh, listening to it constantly, hearing the different voices, different version of the, uh, versions of different conductors, and learning about it, learning about the totem fire, that it was a separate piece, and getting to know that it's, it's this funeral rite, to say it, and that it's the death of the hero, and that's what the first months consisted of. And next came the challenge of actually making it for two hands. So I spent the time looking at the orchestration, uh, finding the melodies, finding the accompaniments. And what's, what I have to make more important, uh, taking into account that I only have 10 fingers and many instruments. So I have to see what's more important, what maybe isn't so important. And when I started to transcribe it, I, th I think the challenge really 
was to be able for example in the beginning the tremolo of the strings the first idea was to hold it on for all of the bars on the right hand mm -hmm. but then i noticed maybe it will be a bit too tiring because he does it multiple times throughout the movement and for very long sections mm -hmm. so in that case i decided to do it a couple of bars on the right hand and then with both hands do the fast notes on the bass mm -hmm. and the celli so Trying to do this small adaptation, for example, to maybe sacrifice a little bit of the tremolo in order to accentuate this line. I think that was one of the biggest challenges for me doing this piano transcription. But well, let's, it, let's, let's listen to that because we have, yes. <laughs> we have not only recording, we have you playing it. So let's have a listen to the very opening. Perfect. <laughs> So again, it's also one thing to arrange, it's another to play it. So of course you uh, have the good luck to test it out on yourself to see if it's actually manageable. Um, tell us about this recording. Do you, uh, was, was you set something up in front of your piano and this is at home, I imagine. Yes, that's right. This is at home. This is actually here where I am right now. So this recording was because I made this recording when I first finished to say the first draft of the first movement i may i have been doing corrections maybe changing some things but each time it has been more little details to change but this recording i made it when i first finished doing the first like demo of the first movement and it was to listen to it myself to record it and then to listen to it and see how much of an impact it made on myself because when I, I, what I'm trying to do is to make myself listen or to hear exactly what I'm hearing when I'm hearing it with the whole orchestra. So I listened to it and I honestly was surprised because first of all, it had been a couple of months of work and I was very happy <laughs> to listen to it finally made for the first time. But I heard some details and went straight into the full score, started changing some things, have been modifying some things to make it as well more of a piano piece because obviously the second symphony isn't specifically thought for solo piano. So it may be sometimes the matter will have some huge chords that you don't have enough of a hand range, hand range to play. And to adapt those, maybe uh, put them in another inversion or something. Mm -hmm. That's what I started to think about when I made this recording. But yes, this recording I made to listen to it myself and to be able to continue uh, perfectioning it and making it as best as possible. So when we talked about this uh, earlier, a few days ago, you, you also were um, uh, emphasizing the fact that this is a draft, but were, you wanted to approach this in a rather innovative way and to make it available online on the Mahler Foundation website. Uh, so that people can try it out and 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 then try send any corrections or suggestions. Is that right? Exactly. Yes, I would. I am going to publish it online, free, because I would like for people to be able to play it. I would love for people to experience 
the, the second symphony of Mahler. Uh, the first movement for now, I am planning of doing the next movements uh, in the future. But I want to do this because I think if people can play it and people can make me suggestions, we can always improve, we can always make it better and we can always make it as close as possible to what Mahler was thinking, what Mahler made this masterpiece. So mm -hmm. I would like to publish it online for people to enjoy it, for people to correct it, to people to give their opinion to me, because that's very important to me as a composer, to know what people think, to mm -hmm. know what people feel when they are hearing what I made, in this case, a transcription. So yes, I am going to publish it and I'm going to be very happy to have people <laughs> giving me feedback on what right. they think with their knowledge of Mahler. Okay, so for all of those interested, this is, uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to post a link. Um, um, when you get the link to this show, we will post this on the um, Mahler Hour uh, portion of the show. There will be a, a, um, a link for this particular broadcast. And in there, you will find an information page about this live stream, including a download link and information about contacting Alexander with your comments. So <clears throat> all I can say is uh, uh, what an opportunity. Uh, this is a wonderful way of, of course, not only uh, helping out Alexander, but of course your own, your own appreciation for this music. So you mentioned you're, you're going to finish the entire symphony at some point. You're working your way through it. Is that right? Yes, exactly. I am planning on finishing the whole symphony, but right now I am currently starting to analyze the second movement, just as I did with the first one. But it will take me a couple of years to actually finish it because it's a gigantic masterpiece. And to be able to do the same thing that I did with the first movement with the others, and each time it will get a little bit more complicated because of what I mentioned earlier, the voices, the lyrics. But yes, I am planning to finish the symphony and hopefully in the future to continue doing the other symphonies from Mario. Wow. So I've been asking every one of my guests today, what does the second symphony mean to you, uh, Alexander? What, what do you take from this piece? Uh, what I take from this piece, it's, I, I really, whenever I hear it, I remember that we are going to die, no matter who we are or what we are doing, we are all going to die in the end. And it makes me remember how small we really are in, in comparison with the world, in comparison with the whole universe, what a small portion of this big story that's been created. And in the end, we're going to all have to face the same fate, to face the same fate, which is death. But it also reminds me what we are here for, what we are living for, why, why we are here in this earth. And I think that it's to do what we most like, to simply to be happy. And that's what the other movements, second, third, fourth, fifth, remind me of, that no matter what the end is, we all are here to be happy to know other people, to make friends, but in the end, to remember how small we really are, but what a happy life we live. That's what this symphony reminds me of, and this is exactly what I want to portray with my piano transcription. Well, thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Alexander, and encouraging our audience to get involved with this piece on yet another level. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Finally, <clears throat> one more highly recommended exploration of the Second Symphony, a book. Lawrence F. Bernstein's Inside Mahler's Second Symphony, a listening guide, a publication that just appeared with Oxford University Press. True to its title, this volume brings you much more than the background to the work. It offers 185 online audio examples, including the entire piece, to help you gain a deep understanding of how the work is put together. Leon Botstein writes, at one and the same time, Bernstein has written a closely argued guide to the work, helpful to the first time listener, and also a sophisticated and often unconventional interpretation that it can inspire the scholar and connoisseur to reflect not only on Mahler, but on how music creates and conveys meaning and helps to fashion beliefs, faith, and values. The author, Lawrence Bernstein, was not able to appear on our show today, but I hope to have him on soon to explore his wonderful book in further depth. And now it gives me great pleasure to uh, tackle the questions that you've been sending. I have indeed very many here. I hope we'll get to as many as possible. Um, I, I'm going to take them, I think, from in the order in which we received them. 
So Harold uh, Brief writes, for those of us who don't know German and listen to the symphony, where would we be able to get a translation? Um, maybe you can help out a little bit. I'm gonna ask uh, Marilyn to join us. Yes. <clears throat> yes, to answer that question. So I, I don't know, I can't think of like a, a, an easy access, but if you get a hold of the score of, a symp of the symphony, especially the Dover scores, they always have a complete translation at the beginning. And you know, I'll bet by now there's a lot of trans translations online, yeah. easily, uh, e easily accessible there. Mm -hmm. Actually, are there any on the Mahler Foundation website? Uh, that's I'm I have not looked ahead of this broadcast. I should have done that. I wouldn't be surprised if they're there. I have another question from XO Knight uh, regard, regarding the Urlich. There is a text that Mahler revoked after Oröschen wrote, Stern und Blume, Geist und Kleid, Lieb und Leid, Ewigkeit, something like that. What does this mean in this context? That's a really interesting question and um, hard for me to kind of address here. Um, but I know what you're talking about exactly. There is um, a copy of the song where at the end, Mahler wrote another sort of section of poetry that's very suggestive. And I actually gave a talk about that where it, it refers to a number of, of things that also belong to Mahler's feelings about resurrection that have other connections elsewhere. And it's a bit of a mystery. I think it's the kind of thing where we don't exactly know the answer. We don't know 100% um, why Mahler did that and why he decided to cut it. Um, I, I mean, I actually, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't believe it was part of the song. I think it was uh, maybe um, a dedication or a secret message to um, to someone he was in love with then, or something well, like it's that. Well, it's a text. It's a text that I believe comes from Clemens Brentano, and uh, it oh, was. Yeah. Uh, it was worked into this in a in a way that is 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 rather mysterious. Yes, I, I know if we may have someone watching who's an expert on the Second Symphony, who actually edited it, Donato uh, Stock Void. If she were here, she would be able to uh, tell us much more. Maybe I can have her on a later show. Yeah. Um, the fourth movement, Urlicht. Is it correct that the lyrics of the song are the same? From uh, uh, are the lyrics of a song with the same name from this common Wunderhorn? Uh, well, what Mahler often did, I, I think in this case, he didn't change any words, but what he often did is he would repeat certain lines and certain words um, because he was kind of uh, changing the text slightly to um, to make the musical form that he wanted. And so um, although in the in the the finale, that text, uh, the whole end of the finale is completely written by Mahler, and so um, in Orlicht, I think he stays pretty close to what is there other than adding some, some text repetitions. For example, the line, I would so much rather be in heaven. That, yeah. that is repeated many, many times. And that is sort of the, the theme of the whole song. Mm -hmm. Philip Nunes writes, can the host and guests discuss the importance of Mahler's conversion to Christianity and the cre in the creation of the resurrection? This question is too often dismissed as naive by professional musicians as though Mahler's conversion was insincere, just a means to an end. Um, maybe we could have, uh, if Jason wants to take this or Marilyn, you also want to take this. And believe me, this could be an entire show. Uh, I'm not sure we want to go that far into it, but I, I, I agree this is not something that is trivial and it shouldn't be dismissed, but it is very, complex. I think from the perspective of Mahler research, one could say um, Mahler was a spiritual without being dogmatic, uh, that he had very strong, I think you could say Christian, Judaic, Buddhistic tendencies that uh, was were not committed to any one of those uh, uh, perspectives. Um, but then it is also true that he converted uh, to Christianity in early 1897, and it is also not coincidental that he was late, later appointed, or I mean weeks later, appointed uh, at, the, at the Vienna court. Um, there is a fascinating, fascinating uh, account uh, by a contemporary of Mahler who took a long walk with him one day, and Mahler said, I resented so much that I had to convert for um, political and other reasons 
in my heart of hearts, this was always a part of who I was. He didn't mean to say that I was a Christian, but that there was something that to me was important about Christianity far long before this um, this uh, 1897 decision. I'm going to leave it to the two of you to say a few more things, but we do want to move on as well. I'd love to leap in uh, because okay. it is such a huge question. And um, yeah, so the coincidence, what couldn't have been a coincidence that he converted and then a few weeks later, he gets appointed to be the head of the opera company of the Holy Roman Empire, which is exactly what that was. They're not going to hire a Jew to be the director of the Holy Roman Empire's opera. Uh, so that, that just can't be avoided. Uh, in terms of Mahler's own beliefs, as you mentioned, he was not only non-dogmatic, but um, I, I would say actively so. Uh, I think that he resented and this is uh, something that could be seen uh, in depth in his relationship with Siegfried Lippner, uh, uh, with any notion that uh, uh, institutionalized religion uh, has the answer. Uh, he just uh, rejected that wholesale. And um, uh, Lippner, of course, wrote uh, this very important essay, a speech on the elements of renewal of religious ideas in the present. Uh, that um, uh, I'm sure influenced Mahler because you you almost see some of Mahler's text in the finale as parroting uh, the ideas uh, in that essay. And in a nutshell, um, the love concept that Jesus represented was very dear to both him and Lippiner. Uh, they didn't feel they needed to be Christians necessarily to identify with that supreme notion. So because of time, I'll leave it there. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, maybe I will go on. I, I, this, this is a huge topic, it's fascinating and maybe we will really um, go into it at some point. Uh, another Exo Knight also writes, uh, also the first movement which evolved from the Totenfire poem, uh, there is little information regarding Totenfire available. How was this piece born? There are places in the poem where there are themes of light and hope. Obviously, there is the theme of death, sadness, but also the theme of love and faith. What is the Totenfire poem trying to convey? I have to, I have to first of all, say that the Totenfire poem is not what Mahler is quoting in the last movement of the Totenfire symphony, uh, in the Resurrection Symphony. So what Mahler is quoting at the end of that is a, it begins with a text borrowed from Klopstock that ends up being three quarters of it being Mahler or even more being Mahler's own writing. The Totenfire that is referred to in, with regard to the first movement is a reference to the title of a book that was originally titled Jadi by Adam Miskiewicz, uh, who uh, was translated from the Polish into German by, once again, Siegfried Lippiner, uh, who came from Silesia, who was also, of course, fluent in Polish. So um, the connection to uh, the resurrection idea, the Totenfire idea, uh, and the final uh, text uh, have to be separated. What happens in Totenfire is it is a number of books of, of, uh, of epic uh, drama, in essence, it changes, the characters' names change. It's a very, very uh, long and circuitous journey of the mind, but it does discuss uh, life and death and death. And one of the main characters' names is Gustav. That too would be an enormous, enormous uh, thing to talk about. Maybe we should have uh, done that for today, but maybe we can handle this side of the Second Symphony next time around. I don't know if either Marilyn or, or um, Jason want to say something. Oh, I think that was pretty thorough, Morton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have something here from Julio Asensio Sil Silveiro. I think Mahler's a kind of uh, resurrection uh, of Verstehen is more mystical or pantheistic than in a Christian way, closer to Schopenhauer or Goethe's sense of life. Anyone? <laughs> I, I think that that's probably true as well. I, I, I think my, I, my part of it is I think that Mahler is a seeker. And that I, I think that all of those names that you just named are also at work here um, throughout the symphony. And so uh, again, I think Mahler, he didn't want to be pinned down that way. 
and I think too, probably all of it, and I think this is kind of the own text that he wrote, it's like everyone is welcome, despite the creed, you know, and so like if you're pantheist or, you know, or if you read Schopenhauer, if you are Jewish, if you are Christian, if you are none of those things, you know, you are welcome, you will live forever. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, you're absolutely right, um, but everything else is there as well. Yeah. Well, the notion of living forever, which is, you know, almost synonymous with what we think of as reincarnation, um, you know, it, 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 there are other metaphorical ways of looking at reincarnation. Uh, that's what Martha Nussbaum did in her book. And she views this, uh, uh, which is not at all dissimilar uh, in some ways to how Siegfried Lippner looks at this as a rebirth in life of the genuine self, uh, the genuine sh- self shedding off the um, limitations of uh, society. So we're, um, uh, which uh, I think was extremely important to an artistic mind, particularly wanting other people to share in that sense of seeking, of not following, uh, also, uh, what the questioner um, uh, posed is uh, is a super interesting because, well, what was Goethe's sense of uh, life beyond? Uh, can we even talk about this uh, vis-a-vis Mahler without uh, speaking of Gustav Theodor Fechner? Uh, I mean, it's it's a subject unto itself, but a really fascinating one. Many, many rabbit holes, uh, wonderful ones, and uh, and all of these questions really make me want to uh, to tackle them in a, in a later show. Uh, there's another question here from Knight as well. What is exactly is being resurrected? Uh, resurrected? Uh, what is the theme of uh, an idea of love come from? This ties in, I think, back to also the Goethe and Schopenhauer that we were referring to. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question because we're really way over time. Um, I have a question from Klaus Landes. This looks like it's a question for Alexander. How do you play a drum crescendo in the fifth movement on the piano? <laughs> well, that's actually a very, a very good question. And I would say probably uh, just like the in the first movement with the strings, that we got the tremolo with the octave. I would probably say the same thing, but with the left hand. Well, here it looks like I'm raising the right hand, that's the left one. But I will say probably a tremolo, a low tremolo with the left hand. I think we actually have something similar in the first movement with some tremoli in the strings to when we're descending to the slow funeral march once again. But probably that will be one of the solutions that I will have a low tremolo in the left hand. Okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll find out, won't we? Here's, here's a question from Alvaro Fenal Mula. And this was an inevitable question, Alexander, and I... I I held this back in my introduction to you, but uh, this person is asking, how old are you? (laughs) Wow, what a talent, and how old are you? So you're going to have to either decide to reveal that or not. That's I'm going to leave that up to you. (laughs) Yes, well, I am 13 years old, so I am still quite young. I still have a lot to learn, but I'm doing my best (laughs) to be able to transmit this masterpiece. (laughs) Uh, I think you're doing. I think you're doing pretty well thus far, Alexander. And it's been delightful having you on the show. It's been delightful having everyone on the show. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm, I want to thank our guests, uh, Marilyn McCoy, Jason Starr, and Alexander Vivero, um, for for being on the Mahler Hour today. The Mahler Hour is brought to you by Mahler Foundation and contributors around the world a monthly streaming event bringing together individuals interested in the composer, the thinker, the humanist Gustav Mahler, as we explore not only his life and works, but also how his legacy still informs the essential aspects of the human experience and how we can turn that experience into a force for the good in today's world. Become a member and support our activities. I also wanna thank our fabulous production team, Marco Ayala, our community manager and technical support today, and Monica Anguiano, our executive director for administration. As a reminder, the Mahler Hour returns with another exciting topic on March 26. We leave you today with a yet another version of the Second Symphony, a guitar arrangement of Urlicht by Alejandro Torres. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. See you soon. <laughs>